Holquit Kennedy, or Cole, as she is known to her friends and husband, Walter. This book does not leap into action right away, but the writing is gorgeous, so we don't mind. We are introduced to Colquitt and her husband, Walter, their friends, and their leisurely life in their neighborhood. It's a slow burn at first. It's like wading into a lake and going down the incline, not even realizing that you're going down until you hit the drop off. I discovered the house next door from another favorite author, Stephen King, who wrote about Anne and the house next door in his book, Secret Windows. This is what he has to say about Anne Riverson and the book next door, and the house next door. Since I tabbed everything here, here we go. If Shirley Jackson presents us with a history a sort of supernatural provenance as a starting point, then Anne River Siddons gives us the provenance itself. Mm. The House Next Door is a novel only in terms of its first-person narrator, Colquitt Kennedy, who lives with her husband, Walter, next to the haunted house. We see their lives and their way of thinking change as a result of their proximity to the house, and the novel establishes itself, finally, when Colquitt and Walter feel impelled to step into the story. This happens quite satisfyingly in the book's closing 50 pages, but during much of the book, Colquitt and Walter are very much sideline characters. The book is divided into three longish sections and is really each a story in itself. We are given the story of the Harrelsons, the Sheehans, and the Greens, and we see the house next door mainly through their experiences. In other words, while the haunting of Hill House provides us with a supernatural provenance, the bride whose carriage overturned, killing her seconds before she was to get her first glimpse of Hill House, for example, merely as background stuff, the house next door could have been subtitled The Making of a Haunted House. This is what Anne says herself in writing this book. I came to write of a new house that was, let's say, malignant for the very simple reason that I wanted to see if I could write a good ghost story. I was tired and rather simple-minded from a two-year stint of heavy, serious, writer rewriting, yet I wanted to be at work and thought the ghost story would be fun. And as I was casting about in my mind for a good hook or handle, a young architect bought the lovely wooded lot next to our house and began to build a contemporary house on it. My writing room upstairs under the eaves of our old house looks right into the lot next door. And I would sit and stare dreamily out my window and watch the wild woods and hills go down and the house go up. And one day, the inevitable what if that starts all writers writing bloomed in my mind, and we were off. The plot of the book emerged in one typewriter sitting, almost whole and in infinite detail, as though it had been there all along, just waiting to be uncovered. The house next door was plotted and whole in a day. From there, it looked to be great fun, and I set off on it with a light heart, because I thought it would be an easy book to write. And in a sense, it was. These are my people. I am of this world. On its simplest level, I think it works well as a piece of horror fiction that depends on the juxtaposition of the unimaginably terrible with the utterly ordinary. Oh. So that's what Anne says about oh. writing this book. Awesome. <laughs> so now I'm going to read a couple of uh, excerpts from the book itself. So this, this down here. So I will start with a section of the prologue of the house next door. In the opening, Colquitt talks about how their lives will change once a story arrives in People magazine. Mm. <laughs> Sitting on the white, wrought iron patio chairs, looking just like what we are, 
affluent people in their middle 30s, well and casually dressed, tanned from the summer of not so good tennis at the club, pleasant people who like their lives and appear to love each other, two people leaning a bit forward, looking across a lawn that doesn't appear in the photograph to a house, a house built on a pretty, hilly, wooded lot next door, which doesn't appear in the photograph either. But the house is the reason we are there. The house next door is haunted, and I'm the one responsible for all the publicity. I called the local correspondent at People and told him my story, and I suppose he thought I was just nut enough to warrant checking out. <laughs> After he did, he thought it was a good story. He thought his editors would like it, and he undoubtedly thought I was an aggressive, faintly mad, publicity-seeking, middle-aged housewife with nothing to do, and a house next door that did, admittedly, have some pretty odd things going on in it. Hmm. It doesn't matter what he thinks or what other people think. Not anymore. Our friends are going to think we've taken leave of our senses, and we're going to lose many of them. This is the sort of thing that engenders mild teasing or pleasurable gasps of not quite believing fear when it is kept within the bounds of the group. It is something entirely now that we have spread it out for all the world to see. That isn't done in our set. It lacks taste, and though we don't use the word, class. Worst of all, we have believed the unbelievable and spoken the unspeakable. Yes, we will lose our friends. We cannot worry about that either. For the Harrelson House is haunted, and in quite a terrible way, and it is up for sale again. We're telling as much of the story as we feel is necessary, but by no means all of it, to warn people about it. We took this way because we know by now that no reputable straight news medium will give us airtime or column space and we wanted to reach as many people as possible, as fast as possible. We can document just enough of the story to intrigue people. We do not try to explain it. We have a theory of sorts, but that is beside the point now. We know we run the risk of attracting people to the house. There is a certain type of person who, God help him, will come in droves to see the house, will want to buy it, perhaps. These people we will try to see and warn on an individual basis as they come. We will keep watch. The agents will loathe us, of course, and will tell these people we are crazy, but we will keep on. Perhaps someone will sue us. We are not sure who exactly, since the people who lived in the house until a month ago are dead now. We notice that a different realty firm is handling the house this time. That doesn't surprise us. It's been a different firm for each sale. Eventually, we hope, no reputable firm in town will touch the house and it will be quietly taken off the market. But until that happens, we will try to get everyone who comes to see the house and we will tell them whatever we need to tell them to drive them away. If the article in People leads to more publicity, and this sort of thing usually does, we will welcome it, and use it, and we will tell again about the house. And again. Walter thinks it is probable that he will have to pull out of the agency to sell his interest to Charlie. The agency will suffer from this if he does not. 30 people's livelihoods will be in jeopardy. I know that I will lose my clients. Two have left messages with my answering service for me to call them since this morning. We have a few stocks, some savings, other investments. Charlie's offer will be generous. We can live quite comfortably for as long as it takes. If we find that all our efforts have failed and someone buys the house, we shall set fire to it and burn it down. We will do this at night before it is occupied. In another time, they would have plowed the charred ground and sowed it with salt. If it should come to that, I do not think we will be punished. I do not think we will be alive long enough. Ooh. Ooh.